When we speak of cultural contacts, we must remember that unlike today, in the past, culture seldom travelled from one place to another. Today we have cultural interchange programs where people of one region go to another region and communicate their culture. In the past, this did not exist. The question, however, arises, how do we find Indian influence in places like Burma, Rome, China and even Japan? For example, in Malaysia, temple architecture and postures of the image of the Buddha are similar to those that we see in India. In Rome, the peacock did not exist. The peacock is an Indian bird. But in a particular Roman tomb, we have discovered two peacocks. Where did the Romans get the idea of a peacock? There must have been some cultural exchange between Rome and India. And the answer perhaps lies in economics, trade to be more precise, and to explore this topic further, we have with us here Professor Tapati Shengupta and Professor Srila Roy. Ma'am Shengupta, what do we exactly understand by the region Central Asia? Yes, Central Asia was a very important region which played an important role in this cultural exchange and cultural contact between India and Rome. But you know, it is very difficult and perhaps not right to define any physical region in watertight compartments. So also is the case with Central Asia, but we can roughly define it as a land which lies to the west of the two valleys of Wang Ho and Yangtze Kiang in the east and the, in the north, the uh, plateau of Siberia. To the west, the Ural River and the Caspian Mountains, and in the south, our own Himalayas. Um, so what led to the emergence of cultural contacts between India and Central Asia in the ancient period? First of all, uh, actually Central Asia was not really unknown to the Indians, and it will be very wrong to think that the Himalayas had acted as a great barrier between Central Asia and India. You know, the region of Afghanistan uh, takes a special place of uh, importance in any discussion between conta in contact between India and right. Central Asia. Afghanistan commanded the um, mountain passes, the Hindu Kush, the Khyber, the Bolan and the Gomal. Out of this, the Gomal and Bolan was more important, so also was also Hindu Kush. Actually, these passes were so open, sometimes it appeared that there was no barrier and people would move, caravans would move, missionaries would move, uh, traders would move almost without any hindrance. And there were settlements on both the sides of these passes, which indicates that they need to be guarded right. because they were so important in human movements. Yes, and if we go back to the days of the Indus culture, we find that 
traders from Indus, even they traveled beyond Afghanistan in search of raw material sometimes or sometimes to sell their finished product. This contact became much more important, much more significant when we find that hordes of Central Asian people are coming and settling down in India in search of new homes and this is known as the Aryan migration into India. And more or less on the basis of archaeological excavations, archaeological finds, we can say that it was from the Russian uh, central uh, steppes of the Central Asian regions that the Aryans came into India and after that we find enemies, invaders never stopped coming into India from the Central Asian direction till almost the 18th century. So contact with Central Asia had been very old, very ancient and this contact found a new dimension when we find that another group of Central Asian people coming down to India. Well, this um, great migrations from Central Asia in India did not really um, present any political crisis, but this was going to be of immense importance so far as trade was concerned, culture was concerned and the opening up of India to West Asia and Central Asia was concerned. And we find the new invaders that came were the Bactrians, the Parthians, the Shakas and the Kushans. The Bactrians opened up the Mediterranean region, West, West Asia and the Mediterranean for the Indians. The Shakas and the Kushans would open up Central Asia for the Aryans. We must clarify here another question uh, that would come up, I think, uh, Professor Sengupta, when you spoke about the Kushanas. I think the post Kushana period has been designated as a dark age dark in age Indian and history. A dark and this is what I take exception to. Yeah. Uh, would you believe that uh, the post Kushana period was really a dark age? Actually, it is not only the post Kushana period, uh, it is considered that after the fall of the Mauryas right. and the emergence of the Gupta, Guptas, there emerged a period which was somewhat like the Dark Age. In the first place, theoretically, the concept of Dark Age, the concept of the Golden Age are given up concepts in history. And this was considered as a Dark Age because our knowledge was comparatively very scanty regarding this period, but as a result of various archaeological excavations, as a result of many conferences on in the Central Asian history, and as a result of the tremendous find of the numismatic mater materials from this region, uh, we have unfolded a very rich period of Indian history, and it would be very much wrong to term it as the dark age of Indian history. Efflorescence that we find in the Gupta period, this was the um, uh, sort of a uh, beginning for the great role that the Guptas played in history. Exactly, exactly. So, so it signaled the arrival of the Guptas into Indian politics. No, it politics. was, uh, we w I wouldn't say that it signaled the arrival of the Guptas, but uh, the Guptas took up the strands which were left behind by the Kushans and the Shakas and they added their own Indian uh, touches to that and what emerged was one of the greatest period in the cultural history of India if not of the world. Now coming to the routes that were right, followed right. by the traders to reach Central Asia. R right, the routes, the the routes that uh, Indian trade uh, has followed. They, they followed. Right. To take. Now we know that uh, trade had reached new heights uh, during the Gupta period. Even though it has been said that uh, trade was declining, but we do have some. Uh, 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 examples of very rich trade relations and uh, different uh, routes were established within the country. The Gupta period uh, fostered both internal and external trade 
and we find that trade routes in India were uh, linked with Central Asia ever since the time of the political control of the Shakas and the Kushanas. So it was really nothing new during, that occurred during the Gupta period. Now these routes mainly followed highways and riverways riverways or waterways, but waterways uh, were more popular uh, uh, for bulk trade. Now among the chief waterways uh, that ran from Tamrolipti, which corresponds to present day Tomluk and uh, Holdia, Holdia which is about uh, 80 kilometers from uh, Calcutta, south of Calcutta, to the old city of Champa corresponds to Bhagolpur in Bihar. And from there it proceeded to Pataliputra. From Pataliputra, as you know, is modern Patna. And from Pataliputra, it proceeded to Varanasi and to Kausambi, Kausambi corresponding to Allahabad. And from there, one branch went to the port of Brigukacha. Brigukacha or the port of Broch, right on the western coast. And Brigukacha was the largest entry uh, point uh, on the western coast. So Brigukacha on the mouth of river Narmada. Now from Kausambi again we find that a trunk road passed along the south bank of river Yamuna to Mathura. And from there a branch crossed to modern Rajasthan and Thar Desert to the port of Patala near the mouth of Indus. The main road however went to modern Delhi, then to Punjab after crossing the five rivers there, to the city of Taxila from where it continued till Kabul Valley and to Central Asia. So that was the main route that was followed. And, uh, how did the travelers travel? They had to travel through forests, very dense forests and highways often proved to be rather risky, rather hazardous. And so the traders never traveled by themselves singly, that is what I mean. And uh, they would form into groups sometimes numbering to more than 500 men, uh, mainly because of safety and security against highway robbery. And another thing that we should also remember is the trade was restricted mainly to dry summer and winter seasons. They could not possibly trade during ra rainy season, season, during monsoon when rivers would be in spate and mm -hmm. uh, they would become less navigable. So again, their long journeys would become rather risky. risky. So uh, it was confined to particular seasons like summer and winter. And uh, this brings me to a very important aspect of the trade route, the Silk Route. The Silk Route, the emergence of the Silk Route was historically a very, very significant event. Now, the, in the context of the Silk Route, we find that the Taklamakan Desert was surrounded, was encircled with a number of oases. Oases can be seen in desert areas mm. and these oases played a very important part in the Silk Route itself. And uh, these oases became the staging points uh, on the route and these oases gradually evolved into trading towns and uh, in fact, one can even find Buddhist stupas and monasteries in many of these oasis trading towns, right? So th this is how the oasis were gradually becoming economically, culturally and socially also very important. And the Silk Route followed from Luoyang and Chang'an in China and this route came to Donhuang where it bifurcated. The northern route went through Turfan, uh, Karashahar and Kucha, Kucha or Kuchi, Kucha and the southern route went through Nia and Khotan and finally the northern and the southern routes converged at Kashgar. Now from Kashgar it went to the town of Bactria or Balkh and from there to Iran and the eastern Mediterranean or southwards to India. So this is what the route was like. 
Another thing to note about the Silk Route is, is that it was not a single linear route, right? It had various branches. It would branch off here and there, and it it incorporated a number of branches that took off from these oasis towns that I've been uh, talking about. Now, at oasis towns, what would happen? At oasis towns, the caravans would stop and animals would sometimes be replaced or replenished and uh, the, it would be a resting place and then the movement would start again. The roads were obviously very rough and uh, they had to, the caravans had to traverse through hardy mountainous regions and desert areas and uh, traveling could also be very, very tough because of severe climatic conditions. Ma'am, so what was the significance of this Indo-Central Asian trade? Actually, trade in general, uh, as an uh, action of cross-cultural activity, is very important. And this, to understand this Indo-Central Asian trade, or uh, we can give it two different names, we can say that it was Indo-Roman trade, okay, because Central Asia was an intermediary in this trade which actually began in China and terminated in the Roman Empire because these traders were purveyors of culture. These traders could break the isolation of the places and these traders could also create the environment and also fund the suitable persons and institutions for uh, Im important and significant cultural activity also. So the traders so, themselves were not disseminators of culture? Uh, no, we, we wouldn't say. We can say that they were the catalysts. They were the catalysts. Sometimes some traders were very highly refined mm -hmm. cultural people. The leader of the trading group, the Srishtis, some of the Srishtis who led the guilds mm -hmm. um, in uh, actually in India. And some of them were culturally very, very strong people, culturally very well informed people. But they propagated the culture of India when they went from India or when they came from Central Asia, the Central Asians, they were also great patrons of culture and we can see the florescence of such cultural activities in the Kushana period, in, uh, in the expressions of the Gandhara art or we can say their intellectual activity in the Yavana Jataka which is a very important mm -hmm. treatise mm -hmm. on Buddhism and also very important for knowing about the uh, the, the Central Asian people. So trade is very important but what we have to understand that this trade had two parts. Of course overseas trade, uh, I'm sorry, overland trade was there as Mrs. Roy had been telling us about mm -hmm. the various routes. But when the monsoon wind was discovered, you know part of this trade became seaborne. So as a result of this had a great political implication as well. These would come from Central Asia, then they would take a southerly route and come to the lower Indus Valley. Because you see the Sassanids in this, reg uh, the, the in, in this region, they were creating a lot of trouble. So the, the ultimate uh, destiny of these merchandise was not very sure whether they were going to reach the Roman Empire, that was not very sure. So, all this would come to the Lower Indus Valley or Shentu as it is known in the Chinese records mm -hmm. known as the Ho Han Shu Ho and the Shi Han Shu, mm -hmm. the history of the um, earlier uh, Han dynasty and the later Han dynasty. From this whole, these two books we come to a lot about this uh, trade and uh, about this region also. So we find the Kushans emerge as the Next intermediary, the most important intermediary in this street. What you have to remember about the Kushans is that the Kushana empire that we had in India was not an Indian empire. It was an extension of a Central Asian empire. Okay, having a lot of emporia. Mathura was an emporia. Bactria, Bactra was a very important. Bactra was a capital. And we find that Peshawar was important. Ujjain was important. Pataliputra was in the absolutely in the outer fringes. Varanasi was important. So we find from all these places merchandise would be taken. They would go to, Central, uh, to, to the lower Indus Valley 
from the lower Indus Valley, they would take an overland route, go to Cetlesia. And sometimes they would be all accumulated in either Broach or Barbaricum, and from there they would take the boats and taken by a maritime route to the Roman Empire. Sometimes the Western Roman Empire, they would go to the two ports where the two important places um, on the Mediterranean uh, would be taken. So, part of it was overland, part of it was overseas. Uh, uh, overseas. So, that is very important. Right. And you see that when the uh, when the the Roman import was sort of uh, being cut down, we find that the lower Indus Valley was also losing its importance. But it would be absolutely wrong to think that the lower Indus Valley, the trade was on the decline. This Indo-Roman trade was on the decline. At one time, Pliny had lamented that all the gold, gold of, of Rome, Rome had gone, gone to, to India. India. But now you see, with the decline of the Roman Empire, there was some uh, lesser demands for these luxury items, uh, which they imported from the East, from the Orient. But uh, it was it was not totally lost because the shakas were there. The shakas mm. were there following the kushanas because the kushanas were also um, having a great deal of trouble in their own Central Asian homes because Central Asia in Central Asia we find that this there is continuous migration of homeless people. It is known as the ethnological museum. So we find that different ethnic groups were trying to find new homes and as a result of the uh, Arsacid dynasty which came up, the Kushans found a very strong protest there. But the Shakas continued and it was from the Shakas that Chandragupta too wanted to take away the Gujarat region, the various uh, ports in the rich sea ports of Gujarat, so that the Guptas would be in a position to control the Roman trade. Uh, isn't it also that uh, Chandragupta II, Vikramaditya, was the first Indian king to conquer a region in Central Asia with uh, uh, Balhika? Uh, well, it is it is not exactly Central Asia. We can say it is uh -huh. Balkh, which is in Afghanistan. Afghanistan. He, he went. He was the first Indian king to go to the Trans Indus Trans region. Trans Indus region. Trans Indus region for a conquest. Right. Maybe he wanted to take that possession, but uh, we are not uh, really in the exact knowledge of the of the no, what is the real uh, truth uh, right. whether he was been able but, to had been able to conquer that land but the campaign historians. itself was significant right. because he understood the immense commercial, commercial potentiality potential. of that area what was the chief uh, objects of this trade with central asia oh there were a variety of items that were sent we can see that different varieties of cotton and silk cloth Silk from Varanasi, cotton from Bengal. That was th those were two very important items. Then there was mask. There was uh, elephant tusk, from which beautiful caskets would be made for keeping the relics of the Buddha. Then there was uh, different uh, dif uh, different kinds of spices. Spices made in India, pr uh, pr produced in India. Spices which were imported from Southeast Asia. That that would be sent various kinds of incense would be sent. Then there was uh, alve wool, alve wool sh and uh, you'd be surprised to know that teak was also sent for okay. uh, shipbuilding. And of course there was um, sandalwood, gold and uh, gems from the south. There was yak tail from the mountain, from the hills. Then different kinds of grains in which there was a variety of rice. Food rice grains. was a very, you know, it, it was a luxury item in Rome. It was a luxury item in many places in Central Asia. The, uh, the Indian rice with beautiful aroma, that was in great demand. And as for what was brought from there, we can say the most important item and the most expensive item, one of the most expensive item were the war horses. The war horses. The war horses. The war horses were in great demand in India. You can trace it even in the uh, epics also. So the war horses, uh, they had to be paid in gold coins, and they were brought from the Russia, the center, the, the steppes of Central Asia, and they would be brought overland. But you know, when there were marauders which were coming up in different parts of Central Asia, they would not send these horses 
they uh, by the land route they would be sent by the sea route and now we find the arabian horses were the main item of trade but most of the uh, during the most of the time of the gupta period these horses would come from central, central asia central. by the uh, land route and you would be surprised to know that from here these horses would be sent by ship to uh, the, the very uh, distant destinations in southeast asia and if the horse died hmm. its body had to be thrown into the sea the mane had to be remained and half the price would be paid on the arrival of that mane okay. it shows how greatly horse was valued, valued. Mm. as an item of trade in this uh, time so it was at this time history. that the horses re uh, replaced the elephants in the indian army then, then elephants replaced. elephants were reduced okay. horses were increased okay. okay elephants were reduced the ho the cavalry was becoming more important horse based the, yeah. the the infantry was always yeah. very important the archer uh, the archers were important but the cavalry was becoming larger because uh, import was increasing that's why there were many takers there were many sellers also we have come to the end of today's discussion but the discussion does not end here we have talked about the background to indo central asian relations we have spoken of the various routes undertaken to reach central asia we have also spoken about the significance of trade in the cultural exchange between india and central asia in the coming discussion we shall focus on religion as the main vehicle of transport between india and uh, central asian culture we shall also look at the effects of these uh, cultural contacts with central asia